Hello again, and thanks for staying in with me. It could be argued that creative writers serve a life sentence. Retirement doesn't terminate their work, home doesn't provide an escape from it, for home is where the typewriter is, and those around the writer have to cope with the writer's preoccupation with what is going on in his or her head. Her in this case, because the writer we're visiting is Monica Dickens and two generations of her family. Do you think that part of your drive to be a writer, aside from wanting to write yourself, could it at all have been because you were the great-grandchild? <laughs> I bet you've been asked this a hundred million times. Great-grandchild of Charles Dickens. Do you think... I think it was the opposite, really. Opposite. Because in the family, you know, here he was the great man that we all revered and mm. were taken to his grave on his birthday to lay daffodils and things like that, and it was assumed that nobody would write because we shouldn't be using the name for, for any lesser purposes. And when I started to write, I think among the stuffier members of the family, they may have been a bit upset. They, once they found that it was really a, a career kind of thing and that I was making a little bit of money, they felt better about it, the Dickenses being a very practical family. My parents were never like that. They were absolutely thrilled and delighted because I hadn't really done much work. I'd been rather lazy. I hadn't settled down. I wasn't married. I wasn't um, into a job. And you were and itching to get to some other I was itching side to of something. life, yes. weren't you? Yes, and I wanted to. I desperately wanted to be somebody. I can remember. I never had any boyfriends because I was very fat and my, my more glamorous girlfriends always took any available men away from me. And I used to walk my dog in Kensington Gardens on a Sunday and I remember seeing everybody else in couples, everyone's always in couples, and thinking, you know, and here was I, and nobody paid any attention to me, and thinking one day people are going to know who I am. I, I remember that very strongly. Why were you then so driven? I mean, when you, you know, when you chose to have your children, you chose to adopt them, in fact, didn't you? You, you adopted, mm -hmm. yeah. Why, when you chose that, why did you get, were you so driven still, nevertheless? I don't about, know. You don't I've know. always right. been driven, and I still am. Yes. It's just a part of, of me. Once I started writing, there was no stopping. Mm. It, I mean, you're And right. I don't consider a day is, worthwhile unless I've done at least some work, even if it's only half an hour's correcting. What do you think that you would pass on to people about being a mother? Well, I don't think I was a particularly good one, maybe. You don't? Really, no. Really? Partly Why? because I was writing. I yeah. was always working. I mean, when they were tiny, I used to get somebody to come in during the morning and be with them so that I could have enough time to work. Mm. Um, I think they found me rather distracted, not available enough. I think they didn't like me being a writer because, I don't know, of course it's worse for children whose mother disappears and goes off to an office, but they perhaps thought it was worse to have a mother who was always working at home. Mm. And, uh, you know, you come out of your room to get a cup, cup of coffee or something, mm. you go into the kitchen, but you've still got it all in your head, mm -hmm. what you're working on. Mm. And then you're assailed by half a dozen children saying, the horses have got out, or the dog got run over, or there's nothing for our lunch. <laughs> and you don't really want to know. Yeah, Maybe it's it's allowed to have one. It's no, no. Boston <laughs> Crunch, but it's made in Belgium. Those are nice tangerines for us. Let me get you a little Could bit Could I take yours, Mum? Thank you. I'll put the yeah, thank you very much, Diane. Thank you. Do you like Boston French? No, I say I don't know. Yep. I don't know. Don't know. Well, Monica, what I was going to remind you of is that you said that you were a hopeless mother, but you better ask Pam about it. So I better ask Pam about it. She's a hopeless <laughs> mother. Was a hopeless mother. It was. I think the only thing that was difficult, in not difficult, but that we had to understand was that when she was working, um, that her office was like her sanctuary. You were not to go open the door. Um, and we would stand there as a child 
coming back from school and want to knock on the door but knew that we just couldn't. Mm. So we, we would always leave notes to each other on the kitchen table uh, if we were going to go off somewhere mm. or if mum had something she wanted to tell us but wouldn't be able to because she was working, there'd be the note on the kitchen table underneath the sugar bowl or salt pepper or something like that, which is something I've now um, doing with, with the boys. I will leave them a note. I'm going to go for a walk, and they'll leave me a note. They're going to go somewhere. Oh, so it's handed down from it's generations. It's been handed down. Did you ever feel that you were cutting them out a bit too much by your wanting to write? It's not exactly that I, I wouldn't say I put my work first, though I suppose in a way I did. It's just that if you're going to write, if, while you're actually writing, it's got to come first, or you never would get anything done. There's too many distractions anyway. Mm. So she's a bit harsh it, on herself, you're saying, aren't you, Pam? Mum, very harsh on herself. <laughs> <laughs> she still is. I want to be perfect. You want to be perfect. <laughs> you can't be. I think well. she um, works herself very hard, mm. even now. I think she's beginning to ease up a little bit, not working quite so much. Mm. Mm. There's somebody concentrating so hard on their cards here, he's going to win, I think. <laughs> my back, he's my bet is. Oh, he's Dan. not! Dan. What? No cheating. He slips out under the ace. <laughs> 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 I could have played that. Well, I give up. <laughs> Can you tell me some of the some of the uh, pictures? Well, that was uh, that's my father as a young man. That's <laughs> my husband and I when we got engaged. Mm. That was a picture taken for woman's own. Lovely. And. Um, well, they're really mostly of Roy. Charles, they can. Charles, yes. And, and that, that's, and that's my, your. And is that? That's my father. This is my husband as a sailor. He oh, ran yeah. away from home and joined up Did as a really? sailor. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. What age street. then? Fifteen. <gasps> Good Lord, that's five years yeah. older than Which your was twins. <laughs> led eventually to us meeting because if he hadn't been in the navy, he mm. wouldn't have been sent to London to work at the Admiralty. Monica, the last time I met you, do you remember, you were in fact living in Cape Cod in America, not in this beautiful English, God, it's more English than English. Uh, that's right, I was. I lived on, uh, in America for 35 years mm. with my American husband and um, came back really after he died mm. without planning to. It was the last thing that had occurred to me. I thought I would stay there in our, but the house was too big for me. Plus, it was one of these lovely old white um, wooden houses with black shutters, you know, typical New England house, and the, it needed painting, and I just had the estimate for painting, which was $10,000. I think that probably was one reason <laughs> why I left. Was it difficult? I mean, he was older than you, so had you always talked about the perhaps possibility yes, that he would Yes, we die used to you? talk a lot about what we would do and how if I died first, um, you know, he would get first go at the kitchen and be able to do all the cooking his way, um, which I think is, is a good thing. I think I, I meet sometimes widows now who are so totally unprepared and never talked about death with their husbands. He, they don't drive a car. They've perhaps never even written a check. But um, we we saw this as a possible reality and I thought that I would stay on Cape Cod which I loved and that I would live in part of the house and perhaps let a school for handicapped children use the other part or something like that but when he did die you think you're prepared but you aren't prepared mm. in any way you can't possibly be prepared it's just as big a shock how you know when if a person is ill for quite a long time then people are always saying to you well it'll be better because when he does die you'll be prepared but you're not because mm. the central fact that the person suddenly isn't there mm. is what you really can't get mm. over it's mm. it's so devastating that's just this black hole and the one thing I wanted to do really was escape I, I see now looking back I was escaping from the pain but I thought I wanted to escape from my house in this New England village. 
Wasn't it then quite difficult to set up a house, wasn't it poignant anyway, to set up a house without him as It well? was very, very difficult, mm. yes, and I, I, kept, I kept thinking, oh, this is pointless, why am I doing mm. this just for me? Yet at the same time, I realised that the reason I didn't want to stay in our house there was because that had been our house. And the house itself didn't seem to want me. Mm. It didn't seem like my house. <laughs> and so I thought, well, it makes sense to start a house which is my house. Um, I'd lived alone before I was married, which is also an advantage. I had lived independently, and so I was starting a new, completely independent life. And what you have to do is, is to try and find all the positive things about that. And one of the positive things was finding this marvellous place, which mm. suits me. <laughs> Very well. Yeah.